Good morning and welcome to today's genealogy program. Uh, today is Saturday, April 8th, 2023. I'm Jessica Ashton from the Royal Gorge Regional Museum and History Center. And as always, we are coming to you from City Hall, Canyon City. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let everybody know uh, we do have a um, hike with a paleontologist coming up and it's April 22nd. And some of you may have joined us on those before, or maybe you have not, or maybe you have somebody who would like to join us. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do a different hike than we've done the past few um, hike with the paleontologists. Uh, and this is going to be a little bit more of a strenuous hike. But if you're interested in this, it's going to be a lot of fun. As I said, it's April 22nd. Um, just call or come by the museum if you have questions uh, about the ability level or anything like that. Uh, and to get registered, Registra registration is $5 for that event. Um, one more thing I wanted to say is thank you. A big thank you to all of you for participating um, and being here for the program today. It's, it's because of you that we're able to do these things. So um, at the end of the program, we do leave time for discussion. And historically, we haven't had a whole lot of discussion, but I'd like to encourage you to keep that in mind. Um, and the way that works, there's a little chat button at the bottom of your screen, looks like a talking bubble. Uh, and you can just click on that. You can enter those and it doesn't actually have to be a question. It could be a comment or maybe uh, something that you wanted to share with the group. Um, you can just type it into that chat feature at any point during the program, and then we will leave time at the end of it, um, and I can run through questions, uh, comments, or even if you have any ideas to kind of add to uh, the topic. So today's topic is investigating the causes of death, and um, as we know, our ancestors have died, but sometimes we may not know how they died, and Terry's going to share with us some surprising resources that might help us answer this. Terry, take it away. So, good morning and thank you, Jessica. And as she started by saying, yes, our ancestors did die. And in the days before um, death certificates, we rarely knew exactly what the cause of death was. And that has become something more important in the 21st century for hereditary diseases, um, uh, minor, minor diseases that might have been passed down through the family. Um, you know, did your family have heart disease? Did um, everybody have cancer? What are those other things that are now important to us? So let's start digging into some of this. We are all familiar with death certificates. Um, this one happens to be from 1964, um, and it just shows a, all of the vital information. It does have the cause of death. It has the person's name. We have their parents' names, who the husband um, in this particular case was. And we also have funeral and burial information, what cemetery. What's missing from this one is who is the informant? And I would assume at this point that maybe the husband um, might have still been alive and that he indeed was the informant. Here's another one that's a little bit older from the 1940s and again, we do have the cause of death. We do get the parents' names and we do find out who the informant is. And it's probably the wife of Henry Leonard Flowers. And we do get burial information as well. Even a little bit older, and in a completely different format, um, we get one from Maine. Um, and we see, again, we have the person's name, parents' names, and we do get that cause of death. And as early as 1885, in some cases, even further back, this one happens to be from Vermont. We get 
a simple name, a father's name, the death date, and we do get a cause of death. These records prior to 1920 are actually pretty rare. So if you do find something this old, you are extremely lucky. In most cases, you find something like this. We have a six-day-old child who is the son of these two parents, but we don't know exactly what their cause of death was. Probably at this point, if the child was only six days old, he might have been premature and he might have been failure to thrive. And in the worst case, you come up with something like this, where you just simply get a name and not much more. So where can we look to find out um, what some of these causes of death were. Before we get into that, I want to um, take a look at current um, death certificates because many of those also have what are called the International Classification of Diseases, ICD codes. And you may have seen these listed on a death certificate. This was a program that was initiated by the World Health Organization um, in the late 1800s. And it was to um, standardize and to track the causes of death worldwide, not just in the United States. It was adopted in 1898 in the United States. And these codes have been revised, not necessarily annually, but periodically to include more causes of death, more diseases, and to break down some of the general categories into more specific codes. If you cannot read the cause of death on a death certificate, if it's blurred, if the doctor's handwriting is illegible, these ICD codes will help you to determine the cause. This is a um, part of a listing of the ICD revisions. And while they may have started in 1898, um, my listing that I clipped stops in 1990, but they continue to make revisions. There were simple lists initially, and then they broke them out into three code, four code, um, and other tabular data so that they could uh, determine and track those causes of death. These files are all downloadable so that you can find what a person's cause of death might have been. And you need to look at the particular version that applies to your death certificate. So for example, here is a death certificate from 1923. And while we can read cerebral hemorrhage and chronic nephritis, we've got something over here that looks like myocarditis, but we can't exactly be sure. But here are three ICD codes, 90, 129, and 74. Since this woman died in 1923, we're going to look at the most recent edition that came out in 1920. It preceded her death. And you will notice they are listed in numerical order, the causes of death. We see a couple that are related to typhoid. Most of the initial ones are communicable, communicable diseases. 
we had numbers 74 and 90 on the death certificate. And while we were able to read them, we do see that the 74s all refer to cerebral hemorrhages or apoplexy or a cerebral embolism, cerebral thrombosis, things of the brain. So we get that definition. As far as the 90 is concerned, we get a series that all involve the heart, aortic valve, mitral valve disease, or, or the combination of the two. The number 129 refers exclusively to chronic nephritis for persons that are over 10 years of age. So this is kidney disease, and it is one of the prominent killers even today. So this will help you if you cannot read the information on a death certificate as far as the cause of death. And I just wanted to let you know about that. Let's think about a study of early medicine. Um, the whole body was um, considered to be just a simple collection of parts. Any kind of illness um, way back in Aristotle's time, uh, Plato's time, evil spirits were believed to cause illness. And in the time of the ancient Greeks, they developed the system of the four humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm were considered to be the substance of the body. The blood was actually probably, they thought, produced by the liver. Each one of these characteristics, these humors, um, was associated with an organ of the body. So the yellow bile came from the spleen, the black bile from the gallbladder, and the phlegm from the brain and lungs. And what they were concerned about was the imbalance of any of these humors in the body. And so illnesses did not have a specific source. They didn't recognize that illness was caused by uh, polluted water, a communicable disease. Um, so their treatments then were geared toward targeting the whole body. Um, we hear about applying leeches. We hear about bleeding. Um, other, what we consider today, a little bit barbaric treatments. And the whole point was to get the body back into balance and restore the body in that way. So moving to the early colonies and the development of the United States, Early on, we didn't have very many medical schools or for that matter, hospitals. Uh, patients were treated in their homes um, until the 1800s and actually until, for the most part, the Civil War timeframe. Doctors usually trained as apprentices um, they would work for two years side by side with another physician um, and with the use of books um, and other um, forms of literature, they would complete their education. Lawyers at the same time were uh, trained in a very, very similar fashion, an apprenticeship and through reading. Because some of our ancestors lived remotely, 
they lived in small communities or outside of towns on farms and ranches. Medication was uh, fell onto the shoulders of wives and mothers. And they created herbal remedies um, to hopefully um, at least salve any illness or ailment, if not hopefully cure the ailment. And then we have the development of what we today call the snake oil salesman. The development of um, different mixtures of compounds to cure illnesses um, started pretty early on. And for the most part, the snake oil relied on alcohol. You were going to feel better if you had a certain amount of alcohol in your system. It probably wasn't going to cure you of anything, but um, it made you feel better. And one of the early things was blue mass pills. And these actually contained mercury and all of the snake oils actually advertised um, curing an entire range of diseases whether it be from uh, uh, lung, lung ailments, um, flu, stomach ailments, bowel um, obstruction, et cetera. These medicines across the board would, would cure it all. And we see also the development of patent medicines. This was just a word. It had nothing to do with applying for a patent at the time. But many of today's reputable um, drug manufacturers um, do, um, did rely on their early patent medicines. And as I mentioned a minute ago, the Civil War was one of the driving forces in the advancement of medicine, physicians, nurses, um, and the entire medical profession. They were dealing with disease. They were dealing with wounds. They were dealing with environmental conditions that might have caused um, all of these things. And so they had to come up with ways to um, help their patients. Here's a picture. Um, and we have those blue mass pills. And you'll notice that these were, this particular uh, batch was made by the Upjohn Company, one of the great pharmaceutical firms that still exists today. But we also have Dr. J. Colas Browns, and he's got chlorodyne. We don't have the makeup of um, what was in it, but you'll see that it included um, all of these lung or congestion things. It's going to also um, um, resolve stomach issues. And I think at the bottom, oh, we've got the bowel complaints as well. So it's going to uh, cure everything. It's an entire med medicine chest in itself. Vaccines. Um, one of the earliest vaccines was the smallpox vaccine developed by Edward Jenner. And that was in 1798. And he discovered that by um, extracting a cowpox uh, lesion from a young milkmaid, the lesion was actually a virus from the cowpox. And he discovered that this would indeed cure or prevent smallpox. So this was one of the first major discoveries as far as vaccines were concerned. And it was controversial as you will see in a second. 
With the advent of the 20th century, we see the development of many other um, vaccines that we now routinely um, get perhaps as children um, and development continues as we march forward. This is what I meant by, uh, this is the anti-vaccine society um, very early on. And we see that the cowpox is being used to inoculate people. And this is actually an image of Mr. Jenner. But we see a cow, a bull um, in the picture, and we see these grotesque forms of what happens if you're going if you do get inoculated? You're going to look like a cow. So as time went on, diagnostic techniques also were developed. Um, for the first time, they started looking the, at the actual symptoms. Um, what was this uh, patient displaying? And was there a particular treatment that might be able to be applied to relieve the symptom or cure the symptom? The actual recognition of the environment and personal hygiene was, became very important. Um, many of us know that Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, died. Um, and I can't for the life of me remember what he died of now, but it had to do with the fact that the sewage was being emptied into the streets. And that was what caused the disease that ultimately killed him. And it was then that they buried the sewage um, in, um, and to the, to, which led eventually to the uh, treatment of sewage treatment centers that we have today. We have medical instruments. Um, we had the development of the microscope, which allowed them to see um, more as far as what was causing the disease. And X-ray technology that came about in the late 19th and early 20th century, it was actually introduced at a World's Fair um, that allowed for diagnosing various ailments. And for the first time, they realized that germs um, were the cause of many diseases. And so in the 20th century, we have many leaps in progress in terms of diagnostic techniques. And today, of course, we have many, many machines that will allow further diagnosing. So we've talked a lot about the history and we've looked at some actual death certificates, but where can we find these causes of deaths prior to the development of death certificates, prior to that 1920 to 1930 timeframe? And we're going to look at each of these categories to um, see what they might show us. Excuse me. The US Census um, actually uh, created mortality schedules from 1850 all the way through 1880. So if one of your ancestors happened to die in the year preceding uh, the census time, then they might be included in a mortality schedule. And these are available at Ancestry and I also believe at Family Search. This one happens to be an early one from 1850, and it's from the state of Michigan. And we see names, ages, the sex of the person, um, whether they were married or not, where they were 
born and the month that they actually died. It's important to know um, exactly what month the census was taken in to know whether this is September of 1850 or September of 1849 for the date. So always know, and it's usually in the upper right-hand corner, the date that the census was taken. And then if the person had um, an occupation, in many cases, we see that these are children. And um, let's see, we've got our listing of our causes of death. And we've got consumption and we've got fevers. Um, and I'm not going to go into this at the moment. If there's a disease that you do not understand at the very, very end, I'm going to give you some references on where to look up that information. Oops, excuse me. Here's one from 1860. And we see a very, very similar layout of names, ages, and we see here again, a lot of children, um, where they were born. Um, and on the extreme right, we have our listing of diseases. Black canker was one of the ones that I did not know about. And it happens to be a fungal disease. Um, I had not heard of that one before. Um, but we have smallpox and worms and egg. Um, so we've got a whole listing. This one is from the 1880 Texas mortality schedule. And it has very, very poor handwriting. Um, so I had a great deal of difficulty trying to figure out what some of these diseases were. But we do have um, their names. What is interesting is that this person, when recording it, also did a cross-reference to um, the enumeration district um, and the page where the person's, the rest of their family might have appeared. So that's an interesting part and it gives you the connectivity back to a family group. But yes, we have the month that the person died as well as the illness that actually caused their death. Don't overlook state censuses as well. Some of them, not all of them, um, do include mortality schedules as well. And as we have learned in previous um, lectures, the state censuses were not uniformly um, covered. They weren't all taken in the, fi the five years. Uh, between the actual decennial tables. So censuses might have been taken in 1892, in 1875, or um, later. But don't overlook them. Not every state did do a census, but some of them did, and some of them do have the mortality schedules. And we do get the listing here again, lots of babies, but we also get some old age um, deaths as well. And summer complaint, that was another one that was new to me. And it's a bowel disorder among infants. So even though we see some older children in the four-year-old range dying of the same thing, it's a bowel disorder. I found this interesting, and it was something that I just um, did not know about, but stumbled upon. These are deaths of officers and enlisted men um, during the Civil War. 
Um, and it does include the information in a tabular format. Um, and it wants to know, were they actually killed in a battle? Did they die as the result of their wounds? Um, was it an accident that occurred? Um, was it a wound as the result of an accident? In other words, did a gun go off by mistake or were they killed by friendly fire? Um, were they, did they die as a result of disease um, in the service or did they die afterwards as a result of disease? And this poor gentleman who had survived the war was actually killed by a train um, near Elmira, New York, at the end of his expir or the expiration of his service. So he lived through whatever battles he might have seen, only to be killed by a train. Some states, um, especially the New England states, but other states as well, also um, developed death and birth and marriage registers. Um, and the death registers um, give us a lot of information. Um, we do have when they were when the death was entered, we have their names, their ages in years and months, um, where they were born. Um, and we have who the parents are, but that all important, what exactly are they dying as a result of? And in many cases for children, these registers are very, very important. This is an 1855 one. Um, between censuses. So a child is disappearing and you can get an actual death date for a child. They're not going to be a parent in the 1860 census. They might have been on the cusp of being an adult um, where you think that they might, a girl might have gotten married, but no, these um, are recorded in deaths. So Take a look at these. Here's one, not from New England, but Michigan, um, that gives very, very similar information. We have names, we have parents' names, we have the ages, we have the death dates, and we do have the causes of death. And here again, it's done in an annual fashion. So if somebody died between census years, it might help solve a brick wall. The 1890 census is missing. So here's one from Washington state and it's a death register. And I'm assuming that these two young men might have been uh, brothers. And unfortunately, they're dying, but they lived on Happy Street. <laughs> but we see that our first gentleman died as a result of typhoid and malaria. The two brothers, or assumed brothers, uh, died of typhoid and pneumonia. How long they were ill and who was attending them. Here's part one of a listing from Amelia Island, Florida. And we get the date, we get their names, um, their actual, um, their color. <laughs> um, many of these people are colored, um, their sex, where they're actually where they were actually born and their age and on the following half we actually get their causes of death 
who their physician was, where they actually died, and the cemetery where they are buried. So even in remote areas, island populations, we are getting some of this information. Newspapers. Newspapers are one of the most important places um, to look. We tend to look for obituaries, and in an obituary, it may or may not list a cause of death. In many cases, it will give us a death date, and it will give us the family connection, but it may not give us the actual cause of death. So there may be another circumstance um, where you do find a cause of death. And in this particular case, it was based on a coroner's inquest. And this young lady had given birth to a child. <clears throat> and Dr. Brown, who attended the deceased at the time of her child was born and since, said that she died from puerpal peritonitis caused by having taken cold the second day after confinement. So we get a specific cause of death in the 1880s. There are also accidents, and this has piqued my interest and I don't have a first name, so it's going to be a little bit hard to discover this, but Decker, the noted crack jockey, was killed yesterday while getting off a train on the New Haven and Hartford Railroad at Westchester. And this is what piqued my interest. While we have no anxiety to see any man get killed, we think it is a blessing to the community to know that he will never pull a horse for the bookmakers again. So he must not have been well liked for some reason. There's more to this story. We have, unfortunately, a suicide. And this whole first paragraph um, actually tells, this is from the early 1900s, and it actually tells how he did commit suicide. Many of these old newspaper accounts are extremely graphic. Um, so you might want to um, think twice in terms of sharing them with younger people um, as to how their ancestor might have died. So, and he did leave a suicide note um, that was kind of cryptic. Dear wife, don't take any blame on yourself for you know what caused this. So what did cause him to turn to suicide? Then there are things like epidemics, um, which we have very recently seen. But in 1918, people were dying of the Spanish flu, died of pneumonia following a siege of the Spanish flu. The immediate cause of his death was the Spanish flu. So, um, Look for those newspaper articles. Did one of your ancestors serve in the military? There might be a pension record that actually gives a cause of death. If there were minor children in the family, or if there was a widow um, that needed the money from a pension there might be not only the recording of their service and their death, but the actual cause of their death. And we see that we have William Collins, who is a minor child of Martin Collins, and 
So that's the important thing. We have a pension record here because of this minor child. We see his service dates. He was inducted as a private in July of 1862, and he died on April 7th of 1864 of chronic diarrhea. If you have an enlisted person, in many cases, we find a lot of information about um, those military folks that were officers, but enlisted people um, in, actually enlisted for either three or five year periods of time. And these enlistment registers are available through Ancestry. If they passed away during the course of their service, uh, prior to the expiration of their enlistment, that information is also recorded. The enlistment information is usually in a very, very large register, and we tend to pay attention to the left-hand side of the page, which shows their name, their birth dates, um, a description of them um, in terms of how tall are they? Um, do they have blonde hair? Do they have blue eyes? Do they have, um, uh, are they olive complected? And who is actually the um, recording person who is enlisting them? They will also have the assignment as to what unit they are assigned to but don't overlook the right-hand side of the page and read it carefully because you might find that one of your relatives has passed away. This is a young man. This is part of my family. He was actually born in Wyoming and he is dying in Fort McPherson, Georgia in 1904. He was only 34 years old, but he had multiple sarcomas, and he died in the line of duty of cancer. Going back even further, we find in the 1890s, here again, that missing census year, and we get that this gentleman died in. He was only 33 years old, but he died in 1891. Um, killed by, here's, here's an accident. Uh, and we have dementia and where he is dying, where they are dying. And this might be far from their native homes. So they may have disappeared from the census, but they can be found. Died in 1893 of typhoid fever at Alcatraz Island, California. During the Civil War, the enlistments, we have a death, we have killed, and how this occurred. This person was discharged, but here's another person that actually died. So, and going back as far as 1832, we have spasmodic cholera as a cause of death. So it's not impossible to find these causes of death. Church records are another important place to look for causes of death. This happens to be a 1921 from a Catholic church. And we see that the person did not re receive the sacraments, but we get a cause of death. She died in childbirth. Um, killed by a train, another one killed by a train. So I never realized that 
there were so many deaths as a result of train accidents. Here is a St. Luke's um, church in Rochester, New York, and it is not a Catholic church. Um, I don't remember, I apologize exactly what denomination it is, but this is the first part of the register where we have the listing of the names, um, where they were, where they were from, the ages, and actual street addresses in that intervening census time. And the second page tells us exactly what their disease is and what cemetery they are buried in and who was the attending undertaker in this particular case. And we see the various diseases that are still very popular in the 1870s. We've got croup and we've got diphtheria and just plain old age. Um, it was very interesting to me that somebody had died of old age back when they were only 43 years old. This is an extremely one, early one, and this is from my family. It is a 1706 Catholic church record. Um, and this is rare to be uh, to actually find a cause of death in it. But um, Marie Perron, she's died on the 7th of April, 1706. I apologize, this is in French. She is the wife of Louis Tremblay, who is one of my great grandfathers. And she is died in childbirth on Couche. So even as early as the 1700s, sometimes you can find a cause of death. Did one of your people die unexpectedly as the result of a, an accident? And was there a cause for a coroner's investigation and a coroner's report? These are valuable um, pieces of information. And these are things that are usually not found on the internet, but may be found in state archives or local museum and history centers um, or through your local municipality. And we usually get the names, the information about the person. And in this particular case, we get a description of the corpse, what their external injuries were, their internal injuries, and we finally get a definitive cause of death it was because of a brain, brain hemorrhage due to blunt force trauma. And we get the markings for the various injuries and any additional notes and an approximation on the time of death. In some cases, the coroner's report, an inquiry, an actual trial might need to be conducted. This happens to be a case file from 1911 from the Portland Cement Company um, here in our local area. And we have the deaths of an entire listing of several men. And in reading the report, we get a listing of the questions and the answers provided by the witnesses that were called. And the actual cause of death for most of these people, there was a fire and they are trying to determine why a fire occurred. Um, you know, how did the fumes develop that would cause a fire? So most of these men 
died as a result of smoke inhalation. There may also just be a simpler, simple um, register um, of reports of death from a coroner um, where we get the listing of the names, um, where they actually died, their ages, their sex, and finally, what their cause of death was. There are always those reports where we have, unfortunately, this is a suicide and he was a pistol shot to the head, laceration of the brain, and the ultimate cause of death was a cranial hemorrhage. Um, and of course, we get an entire, uh, an accounting of the investigation and what went into it, who found him, et cetera. There are also some very unusual places um, to look for causes of death. In some cases, there may not be an actual cause of death, but it may give you a date of death that will help you um, lead to other things or suppositions. Here is a case of, and it happens to be from my own family, um, a shipboard death. And it is an infant, um, Mary McMulkin. She is under the age of two, and she died on the 8th. Um, of the month. I do know what the um, actual date of arrival of this ship was in New York, and she died on the 8th in the voyage. It doesn't give a specific cause of death, um, but we're looking at an infant here, a very, very young child, and it might have been as a result of starvation um, or failure to thrive, or some shipboard disease. Likewise, here are a couple of more infants, um, an eight-month-old and 11-month-old, and it gives their actual date. Because these are immigrant children, you probably are not going to end this early on you're probably not going to find any other recording of their existence. So this is important information when tracking down your family um, and its history and to recognize that there was great loss. Then there are those um, monstrous um, causes of death through very severe accidents. The Titanic sank in 1912. So we know that these people died as a result of drowning or hypothermia. Fortunately, oops, I'm going wild with my cursor. Fortunately, those that have hearts next to the name are actually survivors who were rescued. It's only those that have no marking that we know actually died as a result of the sinking of the Titanic. There are also um, uh, alms houses, um, poor houses, um, institutions, and hospital records that might give you causes of death as well. Uh, this one happens to be from the New York area. Um, and we see this person died of bronchitis, um, debility, general debility, bronchitis, um, and convulsions. 
Um, so um, if there's any chance that one of your relatives might have been institutionalized in some form or hospitalized in some form, take a look at those records. Here's a naval hospital, also in New York. Um, and we have an admission record and we have a description of what the complaint was that the person suffered from. And then we get an actual cause of uh, death from exhaustion. We have a complete description of all of his symptoms um, and the problems that he was enduring and exhaustion being the final cause. If they might have been in a state hospital, there might have been a record for that person. We have their occupation, as well as where they were. This is California, but he was last from New Jersey. Um, he entered two weeks ago, and he is suicidal and homicidal. Um, he's got delusions that people want to kill him. And we... Uh, we have our actual cause of death, septicemia. Sometimes, extremely rarely, but sometimes a tombstone will give you clues as to a cause of death. Um, here is the Kennan family. Seven members of the family were killed by a storm in 1875. This is where you turn to the newspaper and you find the location. What kind of a uh, storm occurred in 1875 that this family was wiped out? Probably a tornado, but it could have been a hurricane. It could have been a flood. A newspaper would probably give you the details of the information that you need to find for this. But the tombstone might have been your first clue. Here's another one where 34 unknown men, women, and children perished in a cyclone in 1905. Here again, turn to the newspapers find the locality, find the newspapers for May 10th, 1905 and May 11th, 1905. And are there uh, possibly relatives of yours that might have disappeared at this particular time? And this might explain their demise. Were there major incidents, for example, the Johnstown flood? All of these people were that are missing were probably drowned. Hundred, actually, a couple of thousand people were actually actually killed in the Johnstown flood. The uh, letters that appear at the end of each of these um, also talk about what cemeteries they are actually buried in. Some of the bodies were actually recovered and were then subsequently buried. But is there a natural disaster that might have occurred in an area where your family lived that might lead you to a cause of death? The same with the San Francisco earthquake. There are listings of the people that were killed in these various accidents. In many cases, these people probably were crushed. So um, let me talk just very briefly 
about, um, we mentioned, uh, we've seen listings of causes of death. Some of these um, diseases have new names to them. Consumption was for the most part tuberculosis. Um, we have dropsy, we have egg. We may not know what these terms um, involve. I send you to familysearch.org. They have a series of articles um, on their wiki page that will give you um, this information. Simply doing a uh, Google search, um, listing, you know, what is egg will give you um, this information. But there are several volumes that are very, very helpful and have been described and listed um, what the various diseases are. You know, we see apoplexy and it's paralysis caused by a stroke. We see that very, very frequently. Here's our egg, a malarial infection. So if you don't understand what the disease is, it's very easy to look up this information in these various online things. As we've seen, the causes of death can be grouped into some general categories. They were disease. In a lot of cases, um, children, um, whether it be pregnancy, during the act of childbirth, or the mortality of children, we see an entire grouping there. Accidents and unintentional injuries. Are there environmental causes um, that have uh, developed causes for cancer and subsequent death? We have suicides, um, murders, and even executions. Did someone in your family come up against the law and perhaps be executed? And we see the victims of war. So in conclusion, I just want to encourage you to look for all possible sources. Um, when you find information, um, when you get a will, when you get a land record, these are just kind of off the wall suggestions. Or when you see a military record, make sure you read the entire thing. Um, read all of the pages. Um, one of the things also is if you're using online resources like Ancestry, um, always make sure to go to the next page. Is there a back that was of a document that was also digitized and recorded in Ancestry. So look at all that information and be sure to check for that second page, just in case there might be information for you that you did not know. So with that, I will conclude today's um, opportunity. And if you have any questions, um, you can either put them in the chat right now, or this is my email address and you can send them directly to me. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jessica for a moment. Thanks, Terry. That was great as always. Uh, just a lot of stuff. The, the main question I was going to ask you, you just answered, and that was about those diseases having different names and if we can always figure out what that was. Um, I lost what I was just going to say. Um, I found it really interesting about the four humors, and I had not heard that before, and just kind of how those philosophies got started. Um, Oh, I know what I was going to say. I, on, along this topic, you know, at the museum, we read a lot of old articles, come across a lot of old family histories, and it always amazes me, all these different causes of death. And while there's still, of course, there's still accidents and medical mishaps today, 
a lot of times it makes me appreciate this, how safe the world we live in is now, because <laughs> it just seems like these things happened a lot um, in the old days. But I, I was also going to ask you, on the one that was uh, the headstone that said 34 unknown people were killed by this tornado. How could that be possible that they were unknown? They had like no idea who they were. How would, how could that be? In a lot of cases, um, I know of uh, one case, for example, um, it was, it was obviously, it was a tornado. Um, and I don't remember exactly what that particular location was, but I know of a case, um, where there was a tornado in Natchez, Mississippi, and a gentleman, a traveling salesman from Ohio was actually killed in the tornado in Mississippi. Um, and it is was only in the inquiries of his family that they were able to um, discover him and identify him. So he was he was thousands of miles away from his home. So I'm thinking that um, the area might have been an area that was number one susceptible to tornadoes. And also that there might have been some kind of a large visiting population, so they were unable to identify the people. Oh, that makes more sense. So I was thinking, well, surely they would have known which homes got hit or this or that, but maybe um yeah, if like it, they talked about if like it was a hotel or... or um, for example, in our our recent times, um there was a tsunami. In, in I believe it was in Indonesia. And there were many Americans that were traveling. Um, so um, unless, and in a tsunami, you know, the water is going to wash away everything. Mm. Um, so there were people that um, did not have identification on them when they drown. Um, so they might have gone unidentified as well. Wow, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, come down and see us at the museum. We are a great resource for you know helping with your genealogical needs, especially if you had family uh, from this area, from the Royal Gorge region. We're at 612 Royal Gorge Boulevard, open Wednesday to Saturday, 10 to 4. Thank you.